It's been a week, hasn't it? I don't know about you, but this has been one of the more interesting weeks of the year. I began it with a trip over to Lafayette and ended it with a hurricane. It has been an interesting time. It's incredible. It'll never cease to be incredible to me how quickly these storms can, can pop up and roll through and then life go back to normal as quickly as it went to not normal. But as I was sitting there on Tuesday afternoon and into Wednesday, I couldn't help but think about the way that God had prepared me for this specific situation. You know, as I was thinking Wednesday, I thought about my text for today as I was thinking through what I was going to preach. And the apostles in our text today have been through a very similar thing. Well, if you'll allow me to wax poetic for a moment, they've been through a kind of a similar thing. You see, the apostles at this point in Jesus' ministry have seen Jesus do some incredible things. They've been walking with him for for a little while now, they've seen him perform miracles. They've seen him teach the, the kingdom and the power of God. Just a few verses ago, we saw that they had gotten into a boat to cross over to the other side of the lake, and Jesus had gone back and fallen asleep, and the winds and the waves started to pick up and kick around, and the disciples were losing their minds. They woke Jesus up and said, Jesus, don't you care if we're going to die? And he stood up and rebuked the winds and the waves. And then he turned and criticized them for their lack of faith. The disciples had seen the power of God. And as I was sitting there on Monday evening, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I was thinking about the ways that I have seen the power of God. Not only had I preached that text where we had understood that Jesus was more powerful than the winds and the waves... And that the winds and the waves still know the voice of Jesus. Not only that, but we had also experienced Hurricane Ida just three years ago when I saw God's provision even in that hopeless situation. So on Wednesday evening as the storm came through, I knew a couple of things. I knew that the storm wasn't as powerful as Ida. But more importantly, I knew that God would be faithful through this storm just like He was in the last storm, no matter what the consequence was. And I have to say, even that knowledge didn't keep me from the sin of worry, something I have to repent of. But what I learned Wednesday is what we have learned throughout the past of really all of our lifetimes. That Jesus provides for us. Wednesday, we got an opportunity to apply that truth that Jesus cares for us, that he provides for us. And yes, I know that's easy for me to say as someone whose house was not flooded, whose power didn't go out, who didn't have to replace all the groceries in their fridge. But you know what? Even if that had happened, even if my home was destroyed, I know that God would still provide because he is still faithful. Today, we're going to get another example of Jesus' faithful provision. Last week, we talked about Jesus sending out his apostles. We talked about their their job was to go out from towns and villages to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. But specifically, we talked about the things that they weren't supposed to take with them. Remember, Jesus told them their job, they were to go out, but they weren't supposed to take certain things with them. No staff, no traveling bag, no money, no food. Basically, they weren't supposed to take anything with them that a normal person would take on a journey because Jesus wanted them to trust in God's provision through the hospitality of others. And they have just returned back in our text today, and they're going to see and get a glimpse of God's provision once again. So let's pray one more time, and we're going to turn to God's Word. Father, we are grateful today that you have provided for us, that you've shown us your power and your provision in each of our lives. Lord, as we turn our attention to our text today, would you guide our hearts and minds. Lord, may these be your words and not mine. Lord, may we be faithful to obey. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This is God's word from Luke chapter 9, beginning of verse 7. Herod the Tetrarch heard about everything that was going on. He was perplexed because some said that John had been raised from the dead, some that Elijah had appeared, and others that one of the ancient prophets had risen. I beheaded John, Herod said, 
But who is this I hear such things about? And he wanted to see him. And in verse 10, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus all that they had done, and he took them along and withdrew privately to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out, they followed him, and he welcomed them, spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and healed those who needed healing. Late in the day, the twelve approached him to say to him, send the crowds away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside to find food and lodging because we are in a desert, deserted place. You give them something to eat, he told them. We have no more than five loaves and two fish, they said. Unless we go and buy food for all these people, for about 5,000 men were there. Then he told the disciples, have them sit down in group of, groups of 50 each. They did what he said, and he had them sit down. Then he took five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them. He kept giving them to the disciples to set before the crowd. Everyone ate and was filled. They picked up 12 baskets of leftover pieces. This is the word of the Lord, and we thank God for it. Several things in our text today. We won't spend a lot of time on, on a couple of them, but there is a truth that I want us to see. That Jesus provides for his people. But first, let's dive into the text. In verses 7 through 9, we get this kind of aside. Jesus sends the disciples out to go and do their mission. And we get this kind of interlude story about Herod the Tetrarch, a a regional ruler in that region. I want you to see that Jesus perplexes people. It says that Herod heard about the things that were going on. He heard about this man, Jesus, who was teaching and healing and performing miraculous signs. And he didn't quite understand what was going on. We're going to get into this a little bit more next week when we talk about Peter's confession. But Herod did not know who this man was. So you see, Jesus' power and authority had caused Herod to question where he was, who he was, and where he had come from. Herod thought maybe this was John the Baptist resurrected, for Herod had had John the Baptist decapitated and presented his head on a silver platter at one of his parties. Maybe he had come back to the dead. Maybe it was Elijah, the one they had heard was going to come before the Messianic kingdom. Or maybe this was the resurrection of one of the ancient prophets. Maybe it was like that time that Samuel came back from the dead for just a moment. But in this, we see this truth. That sometimes people hear the stories about Jesus. They understand His power. They hear reports of His teaching, but yet... They do not equate that with the confession of His Messiahship. In other words, they hear all the right things. They hear about the power of Jesus. They hear accurately about His teaching. They may have even met someone who was a follower, but yet they don't accept Him as God. And if I can make a little bit of brief application here. Just because someone witnesses the power of God and hears the message of Christ does not mean they will submit to God's lordship. Sometimes, just sometimes when someone hears the word about Christ, maybe even they see his power working in others' life, maybe they hear clearly the truth that Jesus died and rose again, that does not mean that they will put their faith in Christ. Friends, we cannot logic people into believing the gospel. If someone sees the power of God and hears the word, that does not automatically mean that they're going to turn from their sins and trust in him. Friends, the example of Herod here is an example that we've seen already in the gospel of Luke and that we'll see going on. That there are those who hear the word of God, who know his power, but don't believe in him. Friends, we must trust in the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit to give life out of death. To open the eyes of people to salvation. It is a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit that gives living faith to a dead soul. I don't want to step too far out of the the message of the text here, but I do want to make this point. Friends, it is the work of the Holy Spirit that draws someone to faith in Christ. It is a miraculous work when someone turns from their sins and puts their faith in Jesus. It's not dependent on logic or arguing. It is dependent on whether or not the Holy Spirit is working in their lives. 
So yes, we are called to persuade people to come to faith in Christ. We are called to compel them, to teach them the truth, to beg and plead them to turn from their sins and trust in Christ. But we also must pray that the Holy Spirit would be working in their hearts. That He would give them a desire to know Jesus. Because God is the one who changes people's hearts. That's an aside. We're going to talk a little bit more about that next week, Lord willing. But let's dive into the meat of this story. It's a story that many of us are familiar with. The feeding of the 5,000. And Luke sets it specifically in this context. The disciples have come back from their mission. They've gone town to town, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus has given them power and authority to heal diseases and to cast out demons. And they come back, and this is when all of this happens. As they're reporting to Jesus all that they have heard and seen when they're telling about the, the things that they were able to accomplish of the towns that have believed, Jesus takes them and withdraws privately to a town called Bethsaida. After long ministry, he takes a moment to rest and retreat to consider what God has done. But as they are resting, I want us to see this first truth. The first truth is this. That Jesus cares for the spiritual needs of His people. Jesus cares for the spiritual needs of His people. Jesus cared for the people who followed Him. As they are retreating to Bethsaida to take some rest, look at verse 11. When the crowds found out where Jesus was, when He was trying to get away to have some time with just He and His disciples, the crowds found out where He was. And what does He do? He welcomes them. Have you ever been in a situation like this where you have been working hard? I know I've talked to many of you this morning and you are sore and tired from working in your yards and mopping up the water and cleaning up after the hurricane. And what do you do when you're tired? You want to withdraw, be by yourself, get some rest. But have you ever been in that situation where you're just trying to get some rest but people just kept interrupting you? Where you're trying to get away to, to take a nap or just to be by yourself and, and people keep coming at you. And I'm not talking about like annoying little things. I'm talking about they come at you with real problems. Real things keep coming up over and over again. They're people you want to talk to, but you're trying to get alone. And sometimes when we get to that point, it can drive us to frustration and to anger and even to lash out at people. But look at what Jesus does. He welcomes them. And he begins to pour himself out to teach them. He cares for their spiritual needs. He begins to teach them about the kingdom of God and to heal those who were in need of healing. To do what he had just sent the disciples out to do. To, to multiply his work. To teach about the good news that God is doing a new thing. To heal and, and beat back the kingdom of darkness. Jesus welcomes those who seek Him. He cares for the spiritual needs of His people. Several years ago, our Vacation Bible School memory verse was from Jeremiah 29, 13. God's Word tells us, it promises us, that if you seek Me, you will find Me when you search for Me with all your heart. Paul in Romans tells us that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. We see this same character here in Jesus Christ. When the crowd sought Him, when they wanted to find Him, He welcomed them. And He gave them what they needed. He cared for their spiritual needs. Jesus welcomes all those who call on Him. He welcomes those who come to Him. And He spoke to them about the wonderful news of the kingdom of God. Jesus cared for their spiritual needs. And He demonstrated this by a sincere welcoming of those who came to Him. Jesus did not miss an opportunity to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. He didn't miss an opportunity to proclaim the wonderful things that God had done. Friends, we should do the same thing because this is good news, right? The good news is that God created a perfect world. He created humans just like us in His image. And our design was to be in relationship with God to display His love for all creation, to rule and reign with Him here on the earth. But humans, you and I, our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned against God. They rebelled against His good command. God said, do not eat, and they ate. And just like Adam and Eve, our first parents, you and I do the same thing. We know God's good laws. We know what we should do, and we do the opposite. And because of that, that thing we call sin... We are separated from God. 
We cannot be in His presence. We cannot fulfill the job that He's given us to do. But God sent Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to live the perfect life that we could not. He was fully human as you and I are, only without sin. He never rebelled against God. He never desired His own way over God's way. And He died a death in our place, taking the punishment that you deserve and that I deserve. And He rose again from the dead and invites us to live in that resurrected reality where if we are in Him, we also have power over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And that we have His righteousness given to us so that we can live with God forever. Friends, Jesus cares for His followers' spiritual needs. Just as here, He poured Himself out to His crowds that came to find Him. Just as He gave of Himself to to teach to heal. He longs to do the same for you today. If you are here today and you struggle to believe the truth that Jesus cares for your spiritual life, if you're here today and you're struggling to believe that God can save you because of the things you've done, if you're here today and you are struggling because you believe the lie that your good has to outweigh your bad, Friend, let me tell you, your good will never outweigh your bad. But that's what Jesus came. Just like Jesus cared for the spiritual needs of that crowd that day, He cares for the spiritual needs of His followers today. He cares for you and He will welcome you. If you call on the name of the Lord, if you come to Him weary and burdened, He will give you rest. If you come to Him, those who feel like they can't be good enough, and guess what, you can't. Come to Him and He will save you. He will give you new life. Just as He poured Himself out to teach and to heal the crowds there, He has poured Himself out, His own lifeblood on the cross for you. Friend, if you are struggling to know that Jesus cares for your spiritual life, hear the truth of this text today, that Jesus cares for you. He poured Himself out for you. He gave Himself up for you. So today, if you are struggling to believe the fact that Jesus cares about your spiritual life, If you're here today and you're wondering whether or not you are eternally secure with Jesus. If the question of your good and your bad haunt you, today I call you to come and put your faith in Jesus. To experience a new life. A life free from the fear of death. A life free of the consequences of your own sin. A life that is totally and completely in Christ. The abundant life that He promises us in John chapter 10. Friends, if you are worried about your spiritual life this morning, know that Jesus cares for you. And you can put your faith in Him. But not only does Jesus care about your spiritual need, Jesus cares for your physical needs. Jesus cares for the spiritual need or for the physical needs of his people. Look on with me in verse 12. Late in the day, the twelve approached him and said to him, Send the crowds away so that they can go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find food and lodging, because we are in a deserted place here. You give them something to eat, he told them. We have no more than five loaves and two fish, they said to him. Unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there was about 5,000 men there. When he told his disciples, have them sit down in groups of 50 each, they did what he did, what he said, and had them sit down. And then he took five loaves and two fish, and looking to heaven, he blessed it and broke it for them. Jesus cares for the physical needs of his people. But let me start here before I go any further. All right. Do I have your attention? This truth is hard to believe. I recognize in our day and time today that the truth that Jesus cares for our physical needs is difficult. It might be difficult because you're experiencing a sickness in your life that doesn't seem to be wanting to go away. This truth might be difficult for you to understand because you're facing difficulties with your finances or addiction Or you might be in a relational strife with those who you love. It might be stress from your job or your objects. It might be difficult because you've just been through a hurricane and you don't know how you're going to pay for the insurance that's going to inevitably go up. Friends, 
I know this truth can be hard to believe. We can say it with our mouths, but it's hard for us to feel it in our hearts or to actually say it like it's true. But if you will journey with me in this text for just a moment, as we look at who Jesus is and what he has done, I hope that you will see that Jesus cares for his followers' physical needs. The day had begun to come to a close, and the disciples did what they often do, and they walk up and they tell Jesus a fact that he already knows. They say, Jesus, the day is drawing near, and we're in a deserted place. Send the people away so they can go and find food and lodging. As if Jesus didn't know that it was getting dark and that they were in a deserted place. But instead, Jesus tells the disciples what he often does. He gives them a task that they cannot do. He did it just in the last passage we talked about last week where he told them to go out and do something they could not do. He tells them, you give them something to eat. They said, Jesus, we don't have anything but these five loaves, not like big, like three-foot French bread, like loaves of bread, like dinner rolls. And we have these two small fish. And there are 5,000 plus people here in front of you. What are we going to to do. We don't have enough food. We don't have enough provisions for all these people. We are in a deserted place. So he said, okay, go and have them sit down in groups of 50. So if you can do math, that's about 100 groups of men that are sitting down. And Jesus takes the bread and the fish and blesses it. And then he starts to break it and give it to the disciples to set before the people. Now, we're not told exactly how this happened, whether he prayed and all of a sudden there was mountains of bread and fish before him. I kind of imagine it like the story of the prophet Elijah in the, in the widow of Zarephath, where, where she had oil and flour just enough for that day, and each day there was always more oil and flour. Maybe Jesus broke the bread and the fish and distributed it, and it just kept breaking and kept going and going. It doesn't matter the, the mechanism, but what we know is that Jesus distributed enough food for all 5,000 plus in that crowd to eat and to be satisfied. Now, I know this might seem like a fanciful story. It seems like something straight out of a fairy tale. But friends, this is from the Word of God. It is true. Jesus knew the needs of His people. And He knew that He was powerful enough to provide for their physical needs when no human could do the same. Even when the supplies and the ingredients were not there, He is powerful enough to provide for the physical needs of His followers. I know it's... I've said this just a couple weeks ago, and it's fresh in my mind because of the hurricane. But you remember after, after Ida when we were distributing supplies out here in front of the church. And I remember vividly the day that we were distributing supplies, and all anyone wanted was Clorox wipes. And we were out of Clorox wipes, and we were going to shut it down because we didn't have the supplies that people needed. And all of a sudden, a random car from, from someone we didn't know who didn't know who we were just happened to pull up and deliver a trunk full of Clorox wipes and diapers. And we were able to supply the needs of our community that day. God provided when we didn't have what we needed. A couple of months ago, we were doing our our mission meal down in the French Quarter, and it was in a new situation, and we had cooked food for 100 people, and would you know it, 125 people showed up, and we ran out of food halfway through. And we didn't have any more food. We didn't have a way to go get any more food. We were blocked in. But would you know that in the pantry at the Baptist Friendship House, there was spaghetti sauce, frozen meatballs, and garlic bread? That there were people that we didn't know, that didn't know us, that didn't know we were going to cook spaghetti, that had put that there. God provided for us even when we didn't know it. Friends, if we will open our eyes and see, we'll see that God provides for the physical needs of His followers. I don't know what needs you have today that you need God to provide for. I've told the story before again when I was in college and I was short on my rent. I was not going to be able to pay it that month. And then all of a sudden I look in my student account and there's $300 from a scholarship that I didn't even formally apply for that just showed up there. Another way, Haley and I were newlyweds and praying about where God would have us serve and do His work. And God gave us a stunning clarity of Hurricane Ida to show us that we were to serve here in Norco, Louisiana. Friends, I don't know how God is going to show up for you, how He's going to provide for your physical needs, but I know that you can trust Him to do so. And I know that He will provide. It may be a supernatural means or it may be through other people. 
God will provide for your needs. Just as He did for the people here, He will provide for your needs in your life. So this is the call today. Are you ready? Because of what we've heard in God's Word, the call is this. Will you trust Christ to provide for your physical and spiritual needs? Will you, friend, who's struggling with the, the, the truth that God cares for you spiritually, that He has provided the way of salvation, will you turn from your sins in the way that you have tried to trust in yourself and put your faith totally in Him for salvation? Will you, friend, who's struggling with the idea that God cares for your physical needs, Will you turn from worry and anxiety and put your trust in Him as the one who can provide? Will you, friend, put your faith in Christ as the one who provides for you physically and spiritually? This is the truth of God's Word. I hope that this is, you see, this is not me. This is not just fanciful words. This is what God's Word shows us, that Christ cares for you. In just a moment, we're going to sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. As Trey comes. And I want to give you some very specific instructions. I know we have this altar call thing every week, but I want to tell you what I'm asking you to do. Today, if you find yourself as that person who is struggling to believe that God cares for your spiritual needs, if you're here today and you don't know the security of trusting in Christ for your salvation, I want to invite you to come and just pray. And the reason I'm asking you to come is because it is a commitment for you. It's, a, it's forcing you to make application, to get up and, and walk up here. You can pray with me. You can pray here by yourself. Here's the other call. If you're here today and you are struggling to believe the fact that God cares for your physical needs, if there's something, some worry that you need to lay before the feet of Christ and trust in Him, I also want to invite you today to come. to place your faith in Christ, to acknowledge before God and others that you are trusting in Him. This may be the first time you've done this. It may be the hundredth time you've done this. But I want to invite you today to respond physically with your feet. So as Trey plays, I invite you to come. Let's pray together. Lord, we are thankful that you provide for us, for our physical needs, for our spiritual needs. Lord, forgive us when we have put our faith in something else. Forgive us when we have tried to save ourselves by being good enough. Forgive us when we've tried to to let our good outweigh our bad. Lord, we are truly sorry and humbly repent. Lord, remind us that Jesus cares for our spiritual needs, that He gave Himself on the cross for our sins so that we don't have to, to pay that price, but He has paid it for us. And He stands in heaven advocating for us. Lord, forgive us when we give in to the sin of worry. Lord, not laying our needs before You. Lord, You have promised us in Your Word that we can cast our cares upon You because You care for us. Lord, for those who are sitting here today, Lord, who are wondering whether or not they should come, I I pray that You would give them the boldness to come. Lord, we love You. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name.